All right, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have two fantastic guests on a vital subject, and I'm absolutely pleased to be able to do this today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host. I'm the forum's creator. I'm your chef, chief cat herder for the next hour, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We've been talking about strategy in higher education since we launched almost six years ago. We've touched on it in various subjects. We've hosted campus leaders from vice presidents of various sorts, provosts and deans, more than a few presidents and a couple of trustees. Now I'm just delighted to introduce Joey King and Brian Mitchell. Now this is partly because I know them as writers and I've used their previous book on how to run a university in some of my classes and it goes over really well. I strongly recommend that book from Johns Hopkins. And this new book on leadership and strategic leadership also from Johns Hopkins is an essential way of looking ahead at how we can run and manage and take institutions forward through a very chaotic future. Now, I also have to confess on a personal level, I've known Joey for years uh, we worked together in the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education, and it was a delight to work with them. So even more so, it's a delight to welcome them back on stage. So first of all, let me beam Joey on stage so you can get a sense of who this character is, and we can start a conversation. Welcome, Joey. Hi there, Brian. It's good to be here. Well, it's good to see you. Where, where are you today? I'm just here at home. I put the tie on for the occasion, but don't worry, I got slippers on underneath. All right, well, we'll take your word for the latter. <laughs> We're glad to see you. It, Joey, we, uh, I talked a little bit about the past, but our forum is about the future, and that's how we like to have people introduce themselves. What are you looking forward to for the next year? What are you planning on working on, and, and what ideas are up of, top of mind for you in 2022? But, you know, I think probably the one that's that's most on my mind is a lot of us have been worried about 2026 and Nathan Grau's uh, cliff of enrollment. But, you know, since 2019, enrollment's down 6, 6.6 percent, according to The Washington Post this morning. I think I'm worried about those trends, um, particularly at the community college level. Yes. Uh, it's just it, it's, it's a very troubling trend. Uh, here in Arkansas, community colleges have lost about 18% uh, in the last uh, couple of years. And, you know, I think at a time when, when, when education and, uh, and civility and the things that you learn in college, frankly, are becoming so critical, having fewer and fewer people going is not a, is not a good trend. So that's, that's probably the thing I'm thinking about most this year. Understood. And that's a deep, deeply laid, long running trend. That's not going to go away with the flick of a switch. No. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, by the way, we've had Nathan Graw as a guest previously in the session. Uh, his major book on demographics of higher education, I strongly, strongly recommend. Well, now that we have Joey here, Ty, Fuzzy Slippers and all, let me add another Brian because we need two Brian's to uh, be able to balance one Joey. Uh, let's see. Brian. Hello. Hi. Where are you this morning or this afternoon? Uh, I'm actually in Arlington, Virginia, just across the river from um, from Washington. Oh, very good. Very good. We'll have to drive over and see you once the plague stops being a pandemic. That'd be lovely. And uh, I appreciate the product placement you have behind your left arm. That's a, a <laughs> well, thing. Well, Johns Hopkins would be pleased I did that. That's why I did it. Well, I, I, think, I think you'll find. Uh, I think you find they are. Uh, Brian, I, I have to say, setting aside the terrible problem of spelling in your first name, uh, what are you uh, What are you planning on working on for the next year? What are the big projects or the big ideas that are top of mind for you? Well, if you think about it, we've done two books together uh, through Hopkins. The first book was a kind of primer on how to run a college, a, a kind of uh, book that set the the notion that there are three inflection points in American higher education. The first, during the American Civil War, with 750,000 potential college-bound dead. The second during the Great Depression uh, oh, yeah. and World War II, as you might expect, and the third now. The second book, which is the book we're here to talk about today, is Leadership Matters. And this takes a look at that sort of third inflection point as the starting point for this book and asks, OK, how does one respond then to the third point, which is a combination of the Great Recession, uh, the collapse of the tuition revenue model, uh, and uh, COVID in the post-pandemic era that we'll all be facing. 
What worries me clearly is the way things are, are going, whether or not colleges and universities are going to remain sustainable places, at least as they define themselves today. So I think what would interest me in terms of writing and thinking as we go forward mm. is a conversation between and among uh, thought leaders, college and university presidents and others on the big important points of the day and to see what they're thinking and then try to interpret what we're hearing and then offer our own perspective on it. That would be a fascinating conversation to have. Um, just I think so. I think so. Offhand, I'd be delighted to uh, help host some of it. Uh, we can do that in this forum. Thank you. Uh, we, we, uh, you can see on the screen there's three of us. We can actually cram six people on here at a time. Um, and, that, uh, and the conversation flows very smoothly, uh, de depending on the president. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know who those people are already, so not to oh, worry. Oh, that's, that's, that's what a book is for, as is anonymity. Um, friends, if you're, if you're new to the Future Trends Forum, uh, my role here is not to be the inquisitor, but just to be the facilitator. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions for our great guests, and then it's over to you to hear your questions and thoughts. So as we start talking, start thinking about what questions you'd like to put to them. Uh, maybe in terms of demographics, for example, uh, maybe in terms of uh, presidential level thinking. Uh, this is your form and your venue. And I, I'd like to begin uh, by asking both of you um, about the uh, trend that uh, Joey articulated this morning that uh, uh, I've also been blogging about, which is the question of enrollment. Uh, for various reasons, it looks like uh, higher education enrollment has been declining for 10 years. Uh, slightly year by year until the pandemic, and then it's dropped uh, two and a half, three and a half percent uh, the past two years each. So, a question I wonder is Has America just changed course on the idea that we want higher education for everyone? I mean, that's what we grew up with the idea that the more people, the more college, the better. But have we just had a kind of quiet sea change and uh, we're going to start backing away from that? Well, I'll go ahead and start. I, sure. I don't know if it's if it's a national um, decision making or if it's really just a, a combination of, of, of demographic factors. I mean, we're seeing more first generation students than ever. When you come from a family, I'm a first generation student myself. And, you know, when you come from a family that's not familiar with higher ed, uh, it makes getting engaged in that process all the harder. And I think when we throw prices up, even state uh, university prices that for most families seem shockingly high, uh, certainly private institutions like Brian and I have run uh, are struggling mightily with that. Um, you know, we get in a situation where we're, we're having to describe a value proposition, which we absolutely believe in, but, uh, you know, families are skeptical because you know, it, it is more money than they've probably spent on anything but a house and many of them don't have houses, uh, you know, so it, it it really is a challenge. I, I, I think these these factors are driving it, you know, kind of as, as separate uh, entities, but together it turns into a, a really difficult challenge. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up, Brian, a little bit on what Joey's saying. Please. Um, I'm a I'm a graduate degree guy in history uh, and um, a strong liberal arts uh, also a Boston guy, I guess, since I just said liberal arts. <laughs> uh, a liberal arts guy as well. I believe that that's fundamentally the core of what uh, American education should uh, should exhibit as its kind of bedrock uh, analysis. That being said, the, demograph the demographics are also driven by the realities of the situation. And candidly, the tuition revenue model is failing. Now, it fails in different ways. It fails because of lack of public support. It fails because... Uh, uh, consumers are, are voting with their feet and moving to community colleges uh, from private colleges and universities, an estimated 52% or more of the first time first year experiences begin now at community colleges, which draws down that market. And then finally, uh, even in the research universities, the, way, the patterns of support for research universities are changing, are changing substantially. So the question then becomes if the revenue models are not working, and the demographics are working against them, what does the, the, the trend suggest? And, you know, it's, it's a bit ominous. Um, the, the presence of something I support, which is online education, uh, can be both good and bad. The move towards certificate degrees over, uh, certificates rather, over uh, degree-granting institutions is of real concern. 
And as we move through this third inflection point, those are factors that have to be considered because they'll weigh on what market exists for colleges and universities as they seek to attract students. Again, this inflection point has all kinds of possibilities to it. Um, friends, you can see what the, a rich uh, vein of thought we have embodied in, in Joey and Brian. Um, let me stop asking questions and uh, start picking up yours. To begin with, we have uh, Donald Clark coming to us from across the Atlantic. Uh, and he asks, we've had a tsunami of leadership books, courses, and talks. So why is there so little of it? Higher education has falling enrollment, ridiculous costs, and you need to go to college to be civil? Wow. Joe, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that, that, that really troubles us uh, as we study higher education is, you know, leadership in colleges and universities is very different from practically any other industry in that it's, it's driven by shared governance. So you've got these these, these three sets of, of, of potential leaders. And, you know, I think that we have been watching uh, boards of trustees and faculty um, not being as engaged in this leadership process as they should. We've certainly always had the problem of having uh, presidents and administrators who are overly zealous about yeah. their leadership role. Yeah. But, um, you know, now that we're dealing with these sort of existential challenges, and I felt this great deal during COVID, uh, you know, j just convening meetings isn't enough. I mean, the these different governing bodies have to be equal to the task of stepping up and leading. And, you know, I think that that's probably the most troubling trend is that it, on many campuses, that's not happening. Either it's not happening because it's broken somehow or the those governors just aren't interested in, in taking on that responsibility. Yeah, I, I think Joey raises a good point. Um, governance is, is something that is unique and idiosyncratic to American higher education. Um, the weakest link in governance is where the ultimate responsibilities lies, lie, lies rather in terms of the direction of the institution. That's with the trustees. They're voluntary. They come in three or four times a year. They're not particularly well-trained and they're badly informed. We also have a public relations disaster that's compounded by social media. And if you look at various roles, we'll just pick on the president as an example. Uh -huh. somebody, somebody asked me once what a president was and I said he, he or she had a corporate title uh -huh. uh, trying to act like a 19th century political ward boss dispensing uh -huh. favors while trying to manage a medieval craft guild. <laughs> it's, it, it's extremely difficult to, to sort of understand that, in fact, it's not a corporate job. But at the same time, we, Joey and I, argue in the book that there are three types of presidents, each one appropriate depending upon the circumstances. Uh, the first is the presider. Uh, the second is the change agent. And the third is the strategist. So to answer the question directly, we believe and what we argue in the book is that while all three may be appropriate, at least in the shorter midterm, over the long term, it's the strategist that really has to step forward in order to answer your question correctly. The, the problem was we've often had presider presidents. We haven't had, nor have they been encouraged to be the kinds of strategists they must become at, at the third inflection point. Uh, presiders in chief. Um, uh, Donald Clark just raised his hand, so let me uh, put him on stage so he can, uh, he can follow up on this. Sure. Greetings, sir. Hi there. Yeah, just a, a couple of comments, really. I mean, I was I was sort of taken aback by that and the idea that one has to go to college to learn these, you know, middle class skills of being polite and civil, right? which I absolutely disagree with, because I think we've created a graduate class. And that comment was part of this that looks down on other people in a funny sort of way as if they were lesser beings. I don't think that's leadership. And in fact, I think many of the leadership books, these bromides about, you know, a trust and listening, it's all abstract nouns. And I agree with Professor Peffer Stanford, who's a very famous book on leadership, that, that the leadership industry has been the problem here, pumping people up to have this arrogant view of the people who don't go to college, causing huge social divisions, Trump, Brexit, the Gilets Jaunes in France. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem around leadership is the arrogance of higher education. And these are the people who have created a system that is ridiculously expensive. 
that is selective, that is exclusive, that has built small city states by adding sports. And I think we're just, you know, to hide under the cloak of governance and blame social media or blame the trustees is to avoid the central problem, which is a lack of competence. You know, I think, to be honest, I think that's what you're trying to address here. But that's the real problem here. A combination of arrogance that you, that, that going to college is everything in life and that the rest of the world is I saw the other half, as it were, in fact, more than half, the majority of people are looked down upon. And secondly, the driving of this sector into ridiculous price models. Almost 1.7 trillion of federal debt. This is, it is bizarre to me. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think, Joey and Brian? I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I, I, the point that I was making about civics was really the fact that we stopped teaching it in the United States at the K-12 level. And so we can't expect uh, students not to know anything about civics or understand it if we don't teach it at all. And in fact, many times, many students only encounter it in the core curriculum in college. Um, you know, and that's a that's a failing, I think, of K through 12 curriculum. Uh, as far as as you know, these sort of military industrial complex universities, I agree with you. I think that you know they become everything but focused on their core educational mission and you know for some you know, for some good and some bad i mean plenty of good medical research happens because you know large uh, universities are doing lots of medical research but um you know that that notion of driving the cost model through an institution that is focused far beyond its original mission is is, is troubling and I, I agree with you i think that you know it's creating cost models that are beyond unsustainable. And, you know, we can't just keep staring at people and saying, why don't you think this is worth it? Uh, because it's, you know, they can't, they just can't possibly afford it. So Brian, I think you probably have some. Well, some I, I, and first of all, Joey, I agree with you on the civics argument. I think that there are plenty of competent people in American higher education and in education globally. And I think the situation varies depending upon what global setting, what particular educational institution you're associated with. Um, you know, the, the, the joke is the, the, the air smells different at Stanford. Um, uh, and there's an argument to be made there that supports your position. At the same time, um, I'm not sure it's a question of arrogance. I think it's a question, it's a question of a collapse of the university model in terms of how it's financed. And I think in some respects, in the third inflection point, the issue will tend to take care of itself because although there is a growing cognitive dissonance and a growing chasm between the very rich schools and the, the poorest schools, I can say, having represented 90 of them in Pennsylvania in an earlier job, that among the little Catholic schools and among the smaller, less well-endowed schools and colleges in Pennsylvania, a great deal of good work in terms of getting students at an affordable level with an affordable debt level uh, as they graduate through an education that gives them the same kind of promise that that the American West provided for immigrants in the 19th century in terms of the mm -hmm. land they could own mm -hmm. makes a certain amount of sense in those kinds of places. So it isn't a problem that is uniform across the board. It's a problem that is specific almost to location, type of institution, and the overall and overriding situation, which is the collapse of the financing of what you're arguing. Just a, a quick clarification question, uh, Brian, when you said that uh, this may to an extent take care of itself, are, are you envisioning that the uh, local and uh, regional colleges and universities might mutate rapidly in order to serve their conditions, or do you instead envision them just going out of business? I, don't, I think the answer is yes and yes. They don't have a choice. So they're going to have to adapt, or they're going to either merge, or they're going to close. But the one thing that it's, you know, there, there is a, the, the National Higher Ed Associations make a case that I always think is overblown when they say it's very hard to kill a college. It isn't hard to kill a college. It just takes time. But time for some of them is running out. And for those institutions that are sustainable and adaptable, they're often the small, less endowed colleges because they have to be more creative. And I'll just say, I'll just say very quickly, look what's happening in Pennsylvania, for example, among the public mm -hmm. sector, the state system colleges and universities, which are going through wholesale mergers. So it's beginning, you're beginning to see the, the, the seeding of change. Uh, 
Donald, thank you for the great question. Good uh, question. Really Good question. I put a link to your blog uh, in the chat because it's a terrific blog. And uh, I hope you have a good night there on the uh, nighttime side of the Atlantic. Uh, thank you. Brian and Joey, thank you for uh, superb, superb answers. Friends, if you're new to the forum, um, those were two examples of text questions and uh, video questions. So just click the raised hand if you want to follow Donald. I don't know if you can beat his wonderful Scots accent, but you can try. Uh, or put in more questions in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, and we've got a really, really good one from uh, Raj Devasagayam at Monmouth University. And he asks, oops, he asks, uh, could the panelists comment on the bombastic and intentionally provocative statement that a liberal education is a luxury this generation can no longer afford? Uh, is the joyless pursuit of money the future? Good question, too. Joey, I, I, I had the last comment. You want to take that one, maybe? Well, you know, I think as presidents of liberal arts colleges, we, we endlessly are, are proponents of liberal education and liberal arts. I don't think that they should be a luxury. Um, I do think we do ourselves a tremendous disservice when we talk about them, though, because I think we talk about them in ways that sound elitist and or are elitist. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, what we really should be focused on is what, what we mean by those skills that underlie, you know, a knowledge of the humanities and, and writing and speaking well and, and, and the things that we, we actually intend to do and less, uh, you know, under that rubric of liberal arts. I mean, I think I'm not, you know, I'm not the first to observe it. There's been some great observations that it's like the worst branding ever. It has the word liberal in it and it has the word arts in it, which in the United States, I don't know that you could pick two words that would make that worse. Um, we all we all know that that's not where those words come from or why we use them. But when you get to the point of having to explain that, you basically lost the argument. Joe, Joey had a good piece recently on the liberal arts, so I want to call attention to that. I'll say very quickly, liberal arts is not, it's not about being liberal and it's not about being the arts, to pick up on Joey's point. It's about the ability, and this is the way I would argue it if I were arguing in a, in a public setting for one of the institutions I used to serve. I would say liberal arts, really, it's about the ability to articulate, to write, to apply quantitative methods, to use technology and to work in a collaborative setting. And if you're arguing, in fact, to, to our colleague at Monmouth today, if you're arguing, in fact, for the liberal arts, who would oppose that? Isn't that the, isn't that the purpose and function of what we do as, as educators in a post-secondary setting? And if you can get past the politicization of it, you can begin to understand that that's the core, the bedrock, as I said in an earlier comment, of what we're trying to do. Well, thank you. Thank you. Raj, thank you for the very pointed question. And... Uh, um, thank you, gentlemen, for the answer. We have more questions coming down the pike, and I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to share theirs. Uh, here's one coming from another uh, Virginian. This is Mark Rush at Washington Lee, who, who says, uh, just a comment on the luxury reference. I find it peculiar ironic when I read an article in Chronicle of Higher Ed telling students that English majors make as much money as accounting majors. That's not a question so much as a comment. Um, I mean, is it, I, I guess, Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong, but but you're saying that this seems to be how we think of higher ed uh, in terms of what Raj called the joyless pursuit of money. Uh, that uh, are, are you seeing that organizations like the Chronicle or at least people writing like that are are making that case that we are really profoundly about the marketplace? Well, well, Mark chews on that one. Now he's probably sorry he asked. Um, let me uh, let me share a few more questions that have come in. This is from University of South Dakota, uh, Karen Carr. She asks, the tuition revenue model has been broken for years. It is now going to be addressed by external stakeholders. Why have higher education leaders not addressed it? Good question. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to start with that. I mean, first of all, remember, this is a creeping disease. I mean, it, the cost disease was diagnosed, you know, decades ago about the arts and higher ed and a number of other similar sorts of, uh, of operations that are mainly dependent on human capital. But, you know, our costs aren't entirely driven by that. You know, we look at the higher education price index, the so-called HEPI, and we see that we, we, have a, we have an industry where those costs go up about twice as much as, as fast as inflation. And, it, you know, take that over 10, 20, 30 years, and you're now, you know, radically de uh, deviated from the inflationary rate. So that's, that's one part of it. The other part is the cost disease is true. 
um, you know, as, as Bill Bowen would say, that it, took, it takes six minutes and 29 seconds to play a quartet uh, with four musicians now as it did in, you know, 1787. The pro problem is those musicians are more expensive. Uh, and, you know, that's that's the critical element here. Now, that's not I, I don't want to be the apologist for ignoring this. I think I mean, I, I think that we were recipients of bad advice through the years from 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 a lot of people in regard to where those price inflection points would, would, could go and, and how much you could actually expect as far as, as families' abilities to afford higher education. And we let that drive decision making, whether it be capital expenses or, you know, kind of runaway uh, you know, student life perks and country club campuses that were not wise and they're not sustainable. And, and worse than that, now they're becoming old and, and need to be fixed or, or removed. So, you know, there's all those things going on. And uh, but I guess my final comment is, you know, the other thing that's been happening is the average tenure of presidents and provosts has been getting shorter and shorter, right. just like right. in the corporate world, when you're rewarded for what happens in the next three or four quarters, you're right. not worried about some, what somebody's going to inherit 20 or 30 years from now. Good point. I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. I want to respond to the Washington and, and, and Lee colleague, um, uh, principally because I have two sons and both are graduates in history from Washington and Lee and full pays, I might add. Well, I can uh, I can bring him up uh, on stage. Uh, uh, well, it's just to, yeah, just to sort of comment on that, the, the notion of English and accounting majors. Um, we felt strongly that the children should get a good education. We thought Washington and Lee was a good place. It's where they wanted to go, and we were determined to have them go wherever they wanted. At the same time, if you look at the Chronicle and other places, America is a competitive situation and gaming is the rule. Think of the U.S. News and World Report ratings are the leading example. It's wrong. It is wrong because, you know, I when uh, Bucknell won the uh, 2005 Patriot League Championship, I think I forget where it's quoted, Los Angeles Times or someplace. I'm not sure where. But I said these are the poets uh, and the scientists and the engineers who come to play basketball. And I said that deliberately because I wanted to make that point, which is, I think, the point that you're trying to make. There's a need in, in a book called Leadership Matters. There's a need for us, as I think we do, to call out the fact that those are the kinds of comments, arguably, that American higher ed leadership should be making. To our colleague from South Dakota, you know, I, I'd say it's, it's, a history, it's a history lesson. If you look at the way that budgets worked as the Vietnam War began and college applications began to increase and dramatically, it was, these are the expenses, so we'll bring revenue up to meet the expenses. It was a mom and pop shop in terms of the way it was characterized. That began to work until prices now, at least sticker prices, are approaching seventy-five dollars to $80,000 per year. If that's the case, that then becomes a question as to what's fueling it. Joey's point's a really good point. In fact, we're not only seeing that, in fact, there are there are climbing rock walls, rock wall, climbing rock walls, rock walls, I guess, for which you can call okay. walls. Yeah. climbing walls. Thank you. Climbing walls. Uh, but there are also now fully depreciated dorms that are cash cows that are helping to, to support the undergraduate or even graduate in some cases education that while they're fully depreciated, they're also in terrible need of repair. And so we've got the situation now where the tuition model doesn't support support the kinds of qualitative and quantitative changes that are necessary to move the, to move it forward. So I'd say two things. First of all, it is, as Joey suggested, incremental. It's now reached the crisis point, the third inflection point. And in addition to that, we're now seeing all the sort of weak underbelly starting to come, come out uh, to the forefront and we'll pay a dear price for it. Wow. Uh, well said, Brian. Uh, Mark? I brought you up so you can respond. Uh, do you want to? I don't know what to respond to. That was a lot. But which part of Boston are you from? Uh, I'm from originally from Lowell, although I, until September 21st, I lived downtown. We just moved uh, to Arlington in September. I grew up in Boston. I don't know if you can see there's a re several bits of Red Sox paraphernalia back there in the background. Yeah, we'll have one, of the more, more, one of the more intelligent folks on the, on the call today, clearly. Like, well, good. thank you. And good looking, too. So, yeah, anyway. OK. <laughs> um, you know, the comment I offered, um, 
was really one, I mean, I, I hope it didn't come across the wrong way, but I find it terribly ironic because so much of the complaints in many cases about American model of higher education is the pursuit of the buck, even though it is becoming extraordinarily expensive and mom and pop certainly do want return on investment. Um, and I just find it ironic that some departments who seem to be struggling do make the case that while we, we're all against that, we'd like to point out that you can get just as wealthy um, with an English degree or whatnot. And so the message becomes the same, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, which I find peculiar. I posted another comment though, and just wanted to ask this, um, you know, so is perhaps the European model better? I mean, do are, are, is the American tradition of beautiful, expensive to maintain campuses really becoming sort of a thing of the past? Do we need to become uh, a country full of more cosmopolitan, commuter-based or uh, universities where you know, sports is outsourced, uh, sports is outsourced to clubs. The choir is actually in the town. Uh, you grow up, you go to school nearby. Um, this would be much more affordable. It would wreak havoc with diversity, of course. Washington only would never diversify. Pomona would. Um, but if we think about it, uh, what we're paying for is, uh, you know, the trappings and the desiderata of the American higher ed, you know, environment, which are very, very expensive. Uh, European schools, cosmopolitan schools don't have this problem. Mm -hmm. Thank Joey, you. You, want to, Joe, you want to respond, Joey? Uh, well, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that I think that you're going to see a lot of change in that regard. I think that those sorts of decisions are going to be a thing of the past at most institutions. And even the best endowed ones will start to say to themselves, we should be using the fruits of those endowments for uh, the things that we think are critical to our, uh, our mission moving forward. And most of that is going to be uh, human capital. I mean, it just is. And so, uh, you know, what Brian said earlier is what both of us believe when we talk about these inflection points is in a way like an ice age, they solve themselves, right? They, they, they force decisions and decision making that wasn't happening before. They force leaders to be different. And I, you know, I agree with all these books about leadership platitudes, and that's what we tried not to do here, are, are kind of ridiculous. Uh, we believe that the actual uh, stress that's going to be applied to the higher ed system will create the leadership that will be needed, but it, 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 but but it's beyond just the president and provost. It's all the other parts of shared governance that are going to have to also uh, step up. And and I think that in a way they were muted when a lot of these ridiculous uh, you know climbing wall decisions were made. Yeah, I guess I guess what I'd say is there's going to be a, a chasm between the haves and have-nots in American higher education. The Washington and Lees and the places I represented, like Bucknell, they're always going to be the places that really have really nice dorm rooms and really good libraries and incredible athletic facilities and, and are members of the Patriot League, which is in Bucknell's case, for example. Now, there will be divisions among that. For example, as you may know, in Division Three sports, there, has been, there was an active decision as long as a decade or more ago, even 20 years ago, that sort of took the two levels of division three where the, the sort of scholar athlete has its best representation. Hmm. And it said, you know, we want to be a certain type of scholar athlete school. We do not want to go to a division two or division one model. And there's the, the, the NEA, the NCA is like the papacy. It's, it's, it's a place you can go into, but never fully understand. Um, and so there is that kind of question. However, there are also changes beginning to occur. And Joey, you and I were talking of, like, of places recently like National University, a place where it's a little bit closer to the European model because it's more online, it's more direct, there's not a huge campus infrastructure. Those kinds of places are gonna become more important in this country because there will be mergers, there will be acquisitions, there will be adapt adaptations, there will be uh, certain kinds of levels of, of a particular type of creativity uh, and there will be need. Uh, and the thing I worry about is that that can change the notion of what a degree means uh, in terms of looking at the overall perspective of what happens in higher education. We really do think that calling it a third inflection point is accurate for just that reason. This is this is very, very rich. Mark, obviously your your Boston brain is, has kicked us up a notch and we appreciate that. Um, let me uh, let me just focus a couple of questions in on one theme that has come up, um, and this is uh, this is referring not to the sea change, Joey, that you were calling for, but the 
the gap between uh, haves and haves not, haves and have nots. Um, we had uh, a, a quick follow up question from the awesome Steve Ehrman, uh, who uh, who asked us to uh, think about this. What fraction of students are interested in the have schools as you've described them? So what, what proportion of students are interested in the elites? Joe, you want to take that or you want me to? I'm going to let you take it. I'd say, uh, let's answer it from the college and university's perspective. Uh, yeah. They're going after the same top 10% of the country. So the answer to the proportion from the college and university side is the same kid from the same demographic marker from the same six high schools in a particular geographic region. In answer to the question from the student perspective, I think that's very hard to tell because the case, and it's a point Joey raised earlier, the case is so muddled uh, in terms of where they should go and for what reasons. I don't think a 17 or 18 year old who comes to when I was serving as, as a college or university president, who comes to me as they would sometimes and says, I wanna be a cardiologist, necessarily fully understands what that means, hmm. or necessarily should even be thinking that at 17 or 18. So it, the larger question then becomes, well, what is the value to that individual student? The perspective, the percentage is therefore very hard to define because the student and the intelligence, not the intelligence of the student, but the maturity of the, of the thought process that the student goes into making a decision is often not, it's not really there yet. And so it's hard to say. I, I, so many of my friends from Lowell, Massachusetts, where I grew up, wanted to play football or basketball, and that's why they went to college. So it's, it's, it's really hard to say. Joey? Sure. Well, I, yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think that, you know, but we are seeing some, some fairly substantial change in the trends there. I think testing is, I mean, standardized testing, the ACT and sure. SAT, the dynamic of their controlling your destiny in regard, particularly to elite institutions, has changed more than I ever thought possible, honestly, uh, at least in the short term. It, uh, you know, my daughter applied uh, for college during the uh, the pandemic, and she wasn't interested in sending scores to anybody, uh, even though she had them, uh, you know, and, and they were all optional. And I think, you know, we know, you know, we're not naive. We know that elite institutions have other ways of determining uh, capabilities, and you know they have their own their, their own ways to make those profiles. But for the vast majority of students, that's a very very big difference. Now it's not all positive. I, you know I've run uh, non elite institutions, and you know those scores for us were actually critical in understanding where the student was as far as their ability to do the work uh, that is embodied in our curriculum. So you know uh, I think that that they may become more of a diagnostic tool, but they really have changed in the way that they affect uh, admission. And, you know, it, it, that's a fascinating change. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a good run from both of you at, at this question. Let, let's, let's take us a little further forward. Uh, Tom Hames had a question along these lines as well about the disconnect. Uh, Tom, why don't, you, uh, why don't you join us? Hello, sir. Hey, so I'm going a little further out in the whole um, have not spectrum here. And uh, the question uh, I sort of have is that, you know, a lot of uh, I teach at community college and the struggles my students have now, there's significant economic struggles. There's significant connectivity struggles. There's a lot of disruption that happens in their lives. But there's also a cultural struggle, which I think often gets overlooked. Um, these students come from schools in many cases that do not prepare them for a college experience. And um, they're then taught by uh, professors, even at a community college level, that come out of an experience more akin to what you'd get at a liberal arts college or an elite university or an upper tier public, public institution. And this is the way college is done, right? And that that whole wheel is very unapproachable for them. I have so many students who sort of try to grab onto the ride, but then fall off because they don't understand the point to what they're doing. Yeah. And um, and that's because those students who are have learned how to learn understand the point to what they're doing much more so. Uh, at least know how to play the game to a point where they start to it starts to make sense to them. 
but these students are so culturally disconnected from the experience of school as first-time college students, as students who only see college through the perspective of the outsider and very quickly come to the conclusion of, oh, this is not for me, and then fall off. You know, that's the big thing with commu- with, with these, with, with uh, first-timers especially, is not, not getting in. It's easy to get into a community college. It's staying in. It's, it's maintaining that uh, retention through one semester, the persistent from one semester to the next. Um, I was wondering if you guys could speak to that, that cultural aspect of higher education. I mean, I came from it, absolutely. I went to a, a large first-line public university, the University of Texas, and I went to graduate school where, where Brian spends part of his time at Georgetown. I mean, these were not... Uh, I, you know, I'm not I'm not a product of the community college system, but I've had to learn really hard lessons that I am not my students, and I think that's very typical about them. A lot of professors is that we we our background, our environment, our educational experience is not that of our students. So how do we bridge that gap? Because I think that's that cultural gap often gets overlooked. It's not just about money. I think you're you're, you're right on. I mean, the last two institutions I've I've worked at were majority first generation students and we in the selection of faculty and particularly in the in the tenuring process were absolutely focused on their ability to teach the sort of students that we were called to serve and you know and there were plenty who came and couldn't i mean we we in fact tended to 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 go to uh to short-term you know two-year contracts to begin with just because there were so many, uh, you know, faculty who come into that model who, you know, like many of us, you know, came from a, a, a tradition where, you know, we went to more uh, rigorous and elite institutions, and they, they just had to learn that, you know, these are students, many of them functionally were barely literate, I mean, from the standpoint of a college uh, level. And, you know, if the faculty weren't willing to put in the time to not only do that remediation and the time to, to, to closely monitor those students and, and, and help them over the hurdles, they weren't the right faculty. And, and that's just a, that's a reality that I think more and more institutions are going to grapple with. And, you know, some institutions are bringing on, you know, teaching faculty. I, you know, in a way, I, I really support that. In another way, I think it's a terrible trend. But, you know. We're not here to debate that for now, but I do think it, it, it's a it's a realization of the difficulties of having students who are much less prepared and or don't understand how this credential is connected to why am I taking this writing class? I mean, how, how do those even connect? Tom, I want to ask you a question because it would help me provide an mm-hmm. answer in, in, um, in addition to what Joey said. Um, why did they come to a community college? What brings a student to a community college. They, they, they don't understand where they're getting to, but how did they get there in the first place? Hmm. Hmm. I think a lot of times there's an expectation that the only way you get yourself out of your current predicament is by right. getting a college degree. Right. But they have no idea what that means and and why why that's the case. No one's ever explained it to them. And there's also an incredible amount of pressure just to sort of shepherd them through so that they ultimately get that college degree. And I worry about them when they get out of that experience, not having the skills when they hit an upper level college or in the in the job market as a whole, that they don't have the thinking skills that people expect of people who have a college degree. Now that's another set of issues, which sure. isn't unique to you, you, to community colleges either, is that you know we're graduating a lot of people with lousy critical thinking and writing skills and the kind of things you expect to get out of college. But it's worse for them in some ways. Well, you know, I'll, I'll go back to my earlier assessment. Frederick Jackson Turner's argument that the, the American West provided a safety valve for the immigrants that came across education, both secondary education provides the same level of safety valve. Mm-hmm. Your argument is that the students are pragmatic but uninformed, which is an interesting argument and I think a correct one to make. I think it starts at the, at the high school level in terms of the counseling. I think it goes to the education level in terms of how well the students are prepared, almost the pre-preparation before they sit in class that first day. I think it goes to the financial aid practice. I'm recently living in Boston for 10 or 11 years, 
And we all know what the scandals were when the Boston Globe uncovered the fact that tens of thousands of dollars were being misused because the students would acquire the debt simply because it was an easy way to acquire the debt and pay living expenses. And so they began to mm -hmm. use the system in the wrong kinds of ways. I think Joey's point about hiring is absolutely critical. And then I was, I'll use Boston again. At Bunker Hill, it's a thousand students per a college counselor. Uh, when you have that kind of representation and that kind of management in terms of how you handle your students, it's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's no re there's no it doesn't surprise me at all that community colleges are seeing this this hit in right. enrollment uh, because good. they're like, it's too hard. I can't do this with everything that's going on in my life. I'm you know, it was a, it seems like it's a bet on the future. I have to deal with my present right now. I think that's part of it. But I also think there's a certain amount of, well, my buddy Joe went and he lasted for one semester and all they did was talk about these highfalutin concepts that make no difference to his daily existence. Why should I waste my time and money on this? Back to the, right. uh, that, that, yeah. that's, yeah, um, that's a concern. Tom, thank you so much. Good um, question. Another good and, question. Um, it's always good to see you. Um, and great answer, Brian. I, I, um, I'm reminded of Tracy McMillan Cottom's book on uh, uh, for-profit education called Lower Ed, uh, mm -hmm. where she has the great idea of the college gospel. And uh, it's uh, going to college is the thing you do because it will make you better. Um, we have a question that uh, follows up on some of these points from Greg Britton, uh, the, like I said, the hardest working editor in higher education. Uh, and Greg, uh, uh, Greg brings us back to presidential leadership here thus. Given the challenges that higher education faces, what are the qualities we should be looking for in presidential circuit? Joey, I've been out of it for a while. I think that's a question for you. <laughs> but before we do, Joey, Greg, Leadership Matters, the new book. <laughs> it's a right. really good book. You guys should get this. There you go. You know, I think that it, it comes back to what has always, you know, been important when you when you go to hire a president, and that, and that is, you know, fit for the mission, uh, really strong understanding and belief in shared governance, um, you know, sort of the uh, selflessness that's hard to measure, but, you know, the best presidents I know have it in that, you know, th they're the last to talk about themselves. They talk about their institutions. They take responsibility for problems and they rarely take responsibility for the good things that happen. And, you know, it's, it, it's no surprise that they're, they're you know that presidents that really do well and that, that are very much respected are the best colleagues. So you know I think that the committees need to focus on that. I mean, there's clearly the credentials and there's all the things that are on the CV, but you know don't go don't go calling people you know at other institutions and asking them what this person was like because generally you're going to get an axe grinder. Uh, you know. It, be fair to them like you would with any colleague and, you know, let the process do its, do its work and do it well. Um, and, and I think that, that that will yield a, a successful president, but um, in the coming, you know, 10 to 20 years where these, many of these, these uh, problems and issues we're seeing are going to become real crises. I think you need to think about beyond just, you know, all those qualities, what sort of leader are they? And, you know, we, we've broken it down into, you know, three types, you know, presiders, change agents, and what we call strategic visionaries and strategists. Uh, I, I, I recognize that's a very reductionist view, but it's useful because I think that as institutions encounter more critical issues and issues that haven't uh, been in their, in, in their, realm of understanding or realm of, 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 of dealing with, with, with that sort of difficulty, um, you know, they're going to need the kind of leaders that can tackle that. And it's going to, I mean, I, I hate to say it, it's probably going to chew up a, a good number of presidents in the process, uh, either because they're going to have to do things that are very uh, difficult or unpopular, or they're just going to burn out as a part of the process, which is unfortunate. But uh, you know, I think that that's that's really what what committees should be looking for. Uh, I you know I think that they they should be you know 
very diligent when reviewing CVs and backgrounds, but you know, the, those soft qualities of, of actual leadership and collegiality and, and, and being good shared governors are the things that they really need to be sussing out in that process more than they might have been in the past. Nice answer. Very good. Thank you, Greg, for the uh, uh, pointed question. And thank you, uh, Joey, for the very careful answer. In the, in the chat, we have, uh, as always, a, a perceptive comment from Greg Station, who says, fit to or fit for the institutional mission sounds like what gets missed in a less successful president, but an unclear mission might be part of the problem. Uh, and then uh, George, because he's in California, cites Kerr's California master plan. He has to do it, um, which, which is important. Uh, we have a, a follow-up question on this, uh, back from Raj again, uh, who asks, from a president's perspective, what are some qualities you would like to see in your program? Well, I, I'll start. Um, Brian and I are in agreement that we think provost is the hardest job on campus. Period. No question. Yep. Uh, and so <laughs> the first thing I look for in a provost is somebody who's equal to that task. Because, there, I mean, you could just change the title to thankless job. I mean, it, it, is, it is a very, very difficult job. It is, uh, it's critical to the shared governance process because they stand on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, if you've had a tenured a faculty member who's become provost and you know, they're now wearing both a faculty and an administrator hat and you know, they're getting trustees calling them out of the blue. Uh, so they're, they're really getting it from all three sides. And you know, it, it, uh, it, it's something that, that most department chairs, frankly, and division chairs don't have the experience doing. So that's why many provosts don't last long um, and why many who are good at it you know, look at the presidency and say, no, thanks. You know, that, that's not the, that's not the sort of thing I want to take on. So uh, that's what I look for, Brian. Well, I think, Joey, you will emphasize the correct point, which we both agree that provosts have the, high, the most difficult positions of any senior officer at, at a college or university. Um, I think provosts have to be comfortable with academics. And I know that sounds silly, but if you understand what I mean, it's necessary to under, it's necessary to be comfortable in your own skin because it is precisely that such a difficult job i also think the provost is the place where good things get done the provost office i guess is more specifically correct where good things get done and where what we talk about in terms of some of innovation which is the implementation of a good idea into the mainstream construct of what a college or university does where innovation and creativity can occur Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure if uh, I were a uh, sitting president, I'm not sure whether it's more important to give the president discretionary money or the provost. Um, because the provost, if you believe that academics is the core, which I do, of what a college or university does, the provost really can, uh, I'll use a marketing term, can build the brand, mm -hmm. can really can really be the, 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 the one who articulates the case for the liberal arts, as I tried to define it earlier, who can build the case for uh, excellence, uh, quality, uh, and coherence. Uh, and I think if that's the case, then you have to look very carefully at a provost. And you can see why provosts don't want to become presidents, because a president is somebody who has uh, tremendous breadth, uh, but very little depth by, net, by virtue of what she or he does. Mm -hmm. uh, and you lose that if you move from provost to presidency. Just in the in the chat, Greg Shuckman pointed out UVA's provost was just named president of Penn after only two years in the job. So maybe that provost wanted some of that uh, depth change. Um, well, the I'll just say that very often there are breeding grounds. If you're in an if you're in a not only an elite institution, but if you're in an Ivy institution, that attracts I think often wrongly, although probably not in this case, it attracts wrongly the. Um, that person to the presidency of, for example, of a good liberal arts college because he has or she has the Dartmouth degree. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the inner qualities that make you able to skate to where the puck is going to be, not, not where you went to school. In, my, uh, in one of my Georgetown seminars this semester, we had the students play a simulation game where they had to take different parts, different roles within a university. So we had one student as a president, one as a provost, one as the head of athletics, one the science faculty, one the humanities faculty, and so on. We had about nine students. And by far, the student playing the provost had the hardest time. 
uh, he he was he was just really by the end just exhausted. Um, and uh, it's a good game though, very good game. Well, I'll be glad to tell you about it later. But but later is the point because somehow we have just raced through an hour of conversation. Uh, we have more questions and more ideas and more ways we want to pick your brains, gentlemen. But but we have to pause here for now. Uh, let me just ask: How can we keep up with the two of you besides buying this great book? How else can we keep up with uh, your thinking and your working? Uh, do you maintain newsletters, emails, blogs, Twitter, or do we have to keep stalking you as far as we can? Yeah. Brian? Well, I think the easiest way to keep up with us, Joey's a, a senior counselor right now for us as well, with us as well, and a founder, is to just go on the Academic Innovators website. You'll get all the media that we're doing. Uh, you'll get the, not only the books, but any of the print stuff or any of the commentary in the press. And you'll also see how we're trying to affect change. So uh, that website is being reconstructed. It'll go live by next Monday or Tuesday again after being down for about three months. So maybe go there. Well, please, uh, if, if you if you could, Brian, when it comes up, uh, let me know so I can share it. I will. I will. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for a terrific conversation. Uh, thank you for being so uh, generous with your thoughts and grappling with a wide range of questions. It's been a pleasure hosting both of you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Well, be safe and take care. But don't go away, everybody. Uh, let me just point out what's happening next uh, in the forum. First of all, uh, we have a whole series of topics coming up, as I mentioned before, everything from student debt and public higher education to eco-media literacy. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these questions of the gap between the haves and the haves nots, is leadership actually a desirable quality? What the heck is it? Uh, please join us on uh, Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me or the shindig handle. Uh, or you can join us on the uh, on my blog, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to go back into the past and check out our conversations with previous presidents and provosts and other leaders, uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and subscribe. Uh, thank you all for your great questions. I really appreciate the boldness and provocation of these questions and your willingness to think deeply together, which I think is a great strength in this year of 2022. I hope you all are working very well. I hope you're all, above all, safe and sound. Please take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>